Good morning. Uh, my name is Kostis Maglaras. I'm the Dean of the Business School here at Columbia, and, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Alumni and students that are joining us uh, virtually, Columbia Business School and Barnard College students that are joining uh, uh, here in person and virtually, and then faculty colleagues, accomplished alumni and business leaders. We are really grateful uh, that you're all here uh, today to take part in a dialogue uh, on something that is near and dear to all of us, and that has to do with the advancement of women and diversity in technology and the tech sector and beyond. This is uh, the fifth uh, annual such event that we hold in this ever-timely topic, uh, and uh, I'm especially grateful on behalf of the school for the ongoing partnership that we have with Vista Equity Partners that has really sponsored, led, participated in this event throughout the year. So a profound thank you uh, for that. And it is amazing for all of us uh, to be having this event uh, for the first time in our new campus, which we opened uh, just a little bit less than two months ago. And this is I believe the second event that we're having in this room, and it's certainly the first time I'm speaking in this room. So it is uh, terrific uh, to, be, to be doing that. I'd like to thank, uh, take a couple of uh, uh, seconds to reflect and thank uh, uh, the tremendous relationship and leadership that we have uh, with Robert Smith, who is our graduate from 1994. Uh, and he's the founder, uh, chairman, CEO of Vista Equity Partners, an incredibly successful uh, uh, business leader uh, in the world, uh, but truly also a champion uh, of the school. Um, throughout his time, while he was at school, but certainly since he graduated, he has been close to us. He has uh, helped us uh, through his leadership, through his philanthropy, and through his vision, uh, and he has in particular, uh, led initiatives and our own thinking in trying to create both applicant pipelines, how to attract people to come to the school, uh, and then uh, provide financial aid to be able to create equitable access to the school, uh, and finally, amplify our efforts to help all of these people that come to the school to launch into incredible careers uh, in, the, in their future. And, near and dear, obviously, to Robert. Uh, Robert's thinking is the area of technology uh, and sort of the digital economy, which is so important. Uh, technology, in some sense, uh, we're having a discussion uh, in the not so uh, a few minutes ago in, over breakfast, has really changed every aspect of our lives. And uh, over the last uh, I would say half a century, which is probably a little bit too long for a lot of us uh, in here, for some of us in here. But I, I, I want to mark, you know, in the 60s, the invention of the microprocessor was a, a milestone event. And then in the 70s, uh, personal computers in the 80s and 90s, tremendous uh, sort of developments in the area of communications. And then we've all seen what has happened in the last two decades. If you, if you think about this trajectory, Every aspect of our lives has been actually disrupted, reimagined, changed, uh, and, and currently we take it for granted. Uh, but, but, it, but it is transformative uh, and, uh, and, and unique, and it has created incredible uh, economic value uh, and opportunity, but not all equally accessed by everyone. So I think it's important for us to just be deeply exploring uh, the digital economy and the digital future, uh, while we're also deeply immersed in this issue of providing access to the digital future to everyone. Here at the school, we're doing a very deliberate uh, investment in that space, uh, and you know we will sort of be launching all sorts of initiatives in, in that area, which I think is strategically important for the school. Uh, it's personally uh, sort of, for me, uh, sort of crucial, and uh, not, not only because I work in that space, but I think it is sort of the most important transformative force, in, both in business education and the practice of business. And, and that will have to do with uh, aspects, all aspects of 
the digital economy, from thought leadership to curriculum that we're doing right now to creating opportunities for students and alumni to participate. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot of you throughout that journey uh, uh, with us. We have the opportunity uh, to hear from some of my good friends and colleagues on the faculty today, talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, business and society, digital transformation, and also diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, now, I'm going to stop talking and pass it to our esteemed panelists. So in our opening session, Martin Taylor will moderate the panel uh, of Vista partner CEOs and leaders and will lead a discussion uh, around the progress and solutions directly impacting the advancement of women in technology. Martin is a managing director at Vista Equity Partners, working closely with Robert Smith, where he's also president of One Vista, responsible for leading the One Vista executive strategy across strategic clients, portfolio companies, partners, and the external directors program. Martin joined Vista in 2006. He's a veteran now, and he was the initial, initial president of Vista Consulting Group. Currently, he also sits at the Vista Flagship Funds Investment Committee and serves as a member of Vista Private Equity Management Company, Committee. Now, joining him are three incredible leaders. Lisa Utsnyder, CEO of Integral Ad Science, Rachel Arnold, Senior Managing Director of Private Equity and Endeavor at Vista Equity Partners, and Ronnie Johnson, who is a Senior Vice President and the Chief Information Officer at TIPCO. Thank you. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dean Margalaris, and uh, thank you for your partnership, uh, and thank the university uh, for their leadership on such an important thing uh, in terms of identifying opportunities for diverse uh, folks, and specifically women. Uh, and obviously, we're here today to talk a bit about uh, uh, the work that needs to be done around some actionable strategies that we've seen to really move the needle in gender diversity, uh, specifically in technology. Arguably, uh, we sit at a bit of the intersection of two historically fairly non-diverse uh, areas, you know, in terms of financial services, in terms of technology, and specifically software. Uh, and so the opportunity to share the stage with these three amazing women, uh, I was very excited to, to substitute in. And so hopefully we'll have a very good uh, morning here and talking about a few things. You know, I think uh, maybe the, the way to get started, and, and we'll do a little bit more about your backgrounds as, as we hop into it, but, uh, and so maybe as we, as we kick off this first piece, if you can just give a little bit more of, a, of your background as we get into it. But, you know, I think the personal journey is important. You know, all of us got to this, this stage, very different paths, uh, and many of us were probably at many times the only one or one of uh, in many rooms and meetings and, and places as we, we began our career journeys. But maybe just from a personal uh, standpoint, maybe, and Ronnie, we'll start with you, because I think of the four of us on the stage, you were the only one who went into college knowing that you would probably end up in some technical field as you were uh, electrical engineer and, and computer engineering major at, uh, at Spelman and Georgia Institute. So maybe, uh, can you give a, a bit about your background, Ronnie, and specifically, how did you find yourself in, in technology, specifically? A, a very, at the time you got into it, uh, not as diverse as it is today, either in gender or ethnicity. Yeah. So I, um, I actually declared my major when I was seven years old as an electrical <laughs> engineer, partially because my dad told me I was going to either get an academic or an athletic scholarship. But um, re really, um, one of the things that I, I realized early on is I wanted to understand how things worked. I was very, very fortunate to grow up in a community of scientists. I, I lived in an area called Clear Lake in Houston, Texas, and it's where a, a strange congregation was starting to form. Uh, my father was one of the first kind of engineers in the oil industry, uh, black engineers, obviously. Um, uh, there were the first black astronauts that were congregating in, uh, in Clear Lake at Johnson Space Center. Um, and uh, they were attracting kind of uh, black doctors, medical doctors, and so everyone around me was a scientist, and so that kind of fueled my curiosity. Um, it gave me, um, empowered kind of my belief system that said I could do it, um, and hence I declared my, my major as an engineer. I spent almost all of my summer since I was 12 years old uh, in summer camps and colleges uh, studying science and, and engineering, and then um, got the wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity to earn a NASA scholarship uh, to, uh, to go to, to Spelman and Georgia Tech. And so that solidified it for me, Martin. <laughs> That's great. You know, and maybe Lisa, uh, you know, let's talk about a bit your journey and maybe some of your experiences that, that put you now at the CEO of a publicly traded software and technology firm. Okay, thanks, Martin, and thanks for having us today. 
Um, so my journey is very different from Rennie's. I actually, uh, coming out of college, I thought I'd work in the not-for-profit. I went to the Peace Corps. I was in Eastern Europe, the first group of Americans into Bulgaria. I went and got a master's in public policy at NYU. Uh, I started fundraising, grant writing. This was in my 20s. But what I found was I was gravitating towards the board of directors. I was connecting better with the board than I was with my peers. And uh, many of them, all in New York City, uh, were working in finance and technology and media. And so I realized I wanted to work in technology. And uh, I found my way into Microsoft. I had a round of interviews on the enterprise side of the business, and I was rejected. I still have the rejection letter. To, Martin and I overlapped at Microsoft. I still have the rejection letter today. And when I, and this is old school, right? This is like snail mail. So I received the rejection letter and I just couldn't accept no. And the next day I called the recruiter very politely and I said, hello, I'm Lisa Uchneider. You rejected me yesterday. And she was really taken aback. And I said, no, I'd really like to understand why and would you give me another shot and she said, well, to tell you the truth, you didn't demonstrate enough passion during the interviews. And I said, okay, thank you for the feedback. I would love the opportunity to interview again at Microsoft. And I could hear like flipping through the job openings. And she said, well, we have this really junior entry level position in digital advertising. I'm sure you don't want that. You take a pay cut. And I said, actually, I would like to interview for that role. And I got the job, 10 years at Microsoft, six years at Amazon, three years at Yahoo, uh, and had an incredible run working uh, for some of the largest global technology companies, uh, and today CEO of IAS. That's a great story, and actually a small sidebar, which I did not know that story. When I interviewed Lisa to be the CEO of the company she is now, she was by far head and shoulders better than any candidate, but I wasn't sure if she really wanted the job or not. And I called her back and I said, you're the best person we talked to, but do you really want this job? And what I realized is she was actually interviewing us just as much as we were interviewing her because she actually had so many opportunities, uh, which is a, a testament to her career. Uh, and it's been great having her uh, in, in the role that she's been in for the last few years. She uh, joined there in 2019. Uh, and so, Rachel, uh, let's talk about your journey. Uh, I'm sure it's different than, than Ronnie's and Lisa's for sure, and you now find yourself the co-head of arguably, I think, one of the largest private equity funds run by, co-head by, by two female, uh, um, uh, uh, female uh, co-heads for a fund. So I'd love to hear a bit about your journey. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, gosh, you know, I kind of like Ronnie, I actually, I was born to do this. I started playing office probably when I was five or six years old. I would set up a desk and wait for my appointments to arrive, and I spent my allowance on office supplies, which is kind of a little a little quirky and creepy, but um, but worked out well in that I knew I wanted to study business from a young age. And um, coming out of college, I started in equity research covering enterprise software, and very early on met an early Vista um, found partner who actually talked to me a little bit about the work that Vista was doing back in 2003. And so I joined my first company in 2003, um, running business development and international operations for a small software company in Portland, Oregon, and really fell in love with the way that Vista thought about investing in management teams and partnering to build really incredible companies long term. So I've had a chance to work in four portfolio companies. I run everything from product management, engineering, to serving as an interim CEO, and then joined the investment team about 10 years ago and really you know, have just seen the incredible evolution of both software, but also financial services and private equity. And so excited to, to share more with you all today. No, it's excellent, and thank you all again for being here. You know, one thing that's I think really important is the ability to see people uh, that look like you in roles that you might aspire to have one day. Lisa, you know, when we had that very, uh, very fortunate opportunity to ring the bell at NASDAQ as you took your company public, uh, I remember vividly, actually I still get goosebumps now, as you stood in front of the, the DS there saying, hey, if you can't see her, you can't be her. Um, and so can you talk a bit about, maybe we can start with you and then others, about anybody that, that, you, that helped you or that you looked to for, okay, I can be that person, or, or did you have to blaze your own trail because there just was not anyone kind of like you doing what you wanted to do? 
Yeah, great question. Um, I actually, so for 20 years, I was always based in New York City, always flying west, working for those tech companies. And I had the good fortune at Microsoft, there were several senior women, uh, one who was both a mentor and an executive sponsor. Um, so they were blazing trails, but I remember in my 10 year run there, uh, one of the leaders at a moment in time uh, when I contributed made a pretty significant impact on the business, she pulled me aside and said, you've got it. I, I just want you, she did one of these, like, I want you to know the sky's the limit, you have the potential, and, it, and initially I sort of shrugged it off, like, oh, right, and she said, no, all right, I'm serious here, you, you're sea level material, you have what it takes, and um, having a leader, a female leader, uh, make that intentional, concerted effort to pull me aside and make that statement is something I've taken with me throughout my career, something I've intentionally done throughout my career. Uh, also, I'm such a fan of having clearly defined succession planning. And so with my leadership team, when we identify successors, make sure the leaders are pulling the successors aside and telling them. So as a technologist, um, my early years uh, <laughs> didn't see much representation. I didn't. Um, uh, and I'll talk about the kind of the counter to that. Um, I started emulating male traits, male leadership styles, male communication. I used to wear my hair all pulled back, and I started wearing pantsuits. They weren't this fabulous, though. <laughs> uh, um, and I realized at some point when I started to, to meet other um, women leaders, they weren't necessarily always in technology, but I loved their grace. I loved their poise. I loved their confidence. And I didn't have that because I wasn't being my true kind of authentic self. Um, and I started to kind of emulate things that I, I saw that um, weren't in my field to kind of draw for some confidence. And I think there, there are two kind of main takeaways. Um, one, uh, I didn't get a chance to find my voice in the way I thought I would because I didn't see myself represented. But the other thing it made me do is become comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, so I was able to kind of push past things, like I'm super hyper nervous right now being in front of you guys, but like I'm okay being uncomfortable. I won't take, I won't not take an opportunity just because it makes me feel uncomfortable as a result of that. Yeah, you know, I did a, um, uh, a panel uh, a couple weeks ago and it was with a younger group of, of African Americans across our portfolio. And I just talked about how different the work world is today for diverse folks than it was when I joined or years ago, uh, and that long ago, it was, you wanted to hide your differences. You know, your goal was to just look like everybody else so you didn't stand out, where now it's such a, an amazing opportunity that we have to bring our differences to work uh, and then actually use those as advantages and, con and differentiations for us as we grow our careers. And, you know, Rachel, did, was there anybody in your career that, you know, was a female or, or anyone that kind of helped guide you, or did you kind of blaze your own trails, or, or can you, any, any experiences that you've had? You know, I think, um, thinking back over it, I, I have had mentors my entire life, you know, wonderful women who have supported me, you know, including, you know, especially my mother. Um, but that said, in the work setting, I mean, I, I think I was the only woman around the table for multiple years. Um, even, you know, starting in equity research, I remember I was on the West Coast working East Coast hours, and I would be the only woman, you know, that would show up at, you know, at 4 a.m. for the morning call. And that, that experience has really lasted a long time. It really left a big mark on me as it related to actually really understanding, you know, to Ronnie's point, how, how important it is to understand how the tribalism that happens in the workplace, but also really starting to pivot and, and excited to celebrate the fact that we've never had a more diverse workforce, especially in financial services and, and within private equity. I know for, for us at Vista, we're 49% um, women at this point across the firm and, and just over a third of our senior leaders are women, which is really incredible. It isn't, that isn't typical within the private equity industry. No, no, and speaking of that, maybe just go to that a little bit in terms of now that you all have, have excelled to very senior positions in your respective organizations, can you speak to 
what you see as some of the important things either that you're doing in your companies or that you've known other companies are doing to create, you know, one, a better climate and environment to bring diverse talent, specifically women, into the workplace, but then also things that you've seen to enable them to be successful and create a good path for them. So maybe, you know, uh, Ronnie, we can start with you. Sure. So um, one, I get to draft off the uh, kind of the Vista brand and the infrastructure uh, around recruiting. Um, we at TIPCO, a Vista portfolio company, uh, set an OKR of um, hiring 40%, um, 40 percent of our new hires uh, would be female um, and diverse candidates. Uh, one of the things that we do is we not only share that internally, and how are we doing against that, these, uh, these metrics are published on our websites, they're presented to our boards, we hold ourselves accountable to them. I feel very proud because I'm almost at 60% female hires in this year. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that I tell my team, like we're not going to close that position unless I've seen female candidates. Um, and I tell my recruiters, let I, I need to, you all to understand how important this is to me. Uh, and when I've become or have had the opportunity to be in the position to make this difference, um, I make sure that the team um, understands how important this is. And so we've, we've, made, we've built that into the infrastructure of how we hire. Great. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that I've always loved about Vista is core to our strategy on talent is to level the playing field. And it makes a difference. It, it starts with how you source candidates. It's, it's how you evaluate them, how you really work to remove bias, but also ensure that you're getting a diverse pool of candidates. We also, we invest heavily in our internship programs. We really work a lot on the pipeline because the, you know, at the end of the day, the pool of applicants is limited by the pool kind of out you know, globally in the world. And so we focus really heavily on how do we start to build early pipeline as quickly as possible. We have, we've actually just launched a rising sophomores internship program um, to really start to get more women into finance. We also have done quite a bit of work actually as it relates to um, you know, accelerating our own recruiting strategy and our mentorship programs inside of Vista. I think we host now three major events for women um, across the Vista network, whether it's senior women once a year, um, at our top 50 women. We also do a women's leadership summit for all of our for all of our Vista women, female colleagues, and then uh, <laughs> just came back from it, it, it was a good one too. Um, but yeah, I think it you know it, it's it doesn't stop. It's an everyday exercise. It has to be a top priority, and it's everything from recruiting, programming, and, and support, and then individual. I think your point, Lisa, is a great one, which is you have to actually be willing to invest in, in individuals because people work for people. Uh, sure, happy to. I mean, we've have got a board meeting tomorrow. We're going to go we through this, so we can save some time right now. Yeah, we can just do it. It's up to it you. We can do it now, Martin. <laughs> so um, at IES, we make such a concerted effort to walk the walk every day when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Starting with our board, we are a female, we have our board meeting tomorrow, we have our uh, female majority board. Uh, that is something that I personally made a commitment uh, when we took the company public, that, that we had a, a very diverse board. We also have an, a very successful IS Scholars program, which Arvida is in the house, there she is, the superstar who runs that program. Uh, but it is a, an internship program we now have three groups that uh, intern at IES every year. Half of our interns are female, uh, identify as female, and at close to 60% of our interns we end up hiring uh, full time, which is just fabulous. In addition to that, we have various ERGs or employee resource groups. Uh, our women's ERG is just really, active and involved, ensuring again um, that we're providing the programming and forums where women and all of our employees can come together um, and become more engaged uh, with one another. And then obviously our talent pipeline. And then the final, because uh, the thing I want to call out because we just completed this uh, just last week is as a leader, I make sure in our annual reviews, and we're coming in, finalizing our annual review bonuses, I personally scrub all of the data for our employees. I scrub based on diversity, on level, on function. I've done it throughout my career because there's one thing that doesn't lie is data. And it's just so important that leaders take that extra step to make sure that we are being equitable as a company. No, no, that, that, that's great. And I think that um, 
you know, this is an area where we, you know, I think across all of our companies and, you know, not just Vista companies, but most companies, you know, everyone's looking for what are the other things that we can do. And to your point, a lot of it starts by measurement. Uh, you know, you, you've heard my funny story on this. I just told a couple of weeks ago, but, you know, one of our companies, you know, they really wanted to do the right thing, but they weren't sure what to do. And so they said, hey, our goal this year is to assess all the data to then have a goal for next year. Uh, and we said, well, wait a minute. What if the goal is just to do better? Um, so wherever you are today, just add one or two more. You pick the category, just try to do better. But one thing that we have found and, and you know, is that as we have women in leadership positions, to no surprise, uh, you actually, these things become a bit more uh, uh, pervasive across the organization. You get more questions about succession planning, questions about the diversity of, of, of the bench, uh, questions about the board composition. You know, it's amazing to me, you know, and Rachel, I think Rachel mentioned the fact that uh, we, I think we've got about 80% of our uh, controlled boards uh, uh, have at least one woman on the board. Uh, and just, you know, the questions that happen at the board level about leadership and inclusion, uh, you just see them a lot more. Uh, and so that's why we're so happy that we have diverse leadership teams and diverse boards. Uh, but with all the inclusion programs that are out there and all the energy around this, there's always more to do. And so maybe if any of you have any ideas or thoughts on some things that you think, you know, are missing or things that you think that people should be more conscious or aware of as they are thinking about either their own personal journey or thinking about how they can put things in place to help others. And any thoughts on, on other areas? Rachel? <laughs> you know, I, I think, Martin, part of it is, is, to your point, having a really honest assessment of your starting, where you are from a starting blocks perspective, and then just committing to doing better. You know, the, the pandemic also has created an environment that has been extremely difficult for especially working parents, but, but also working mothers. And so being really sensitive to the dynamics that are changing in the workplace and how do we make it easier for you know, folks who may have left the workforce to rejoin. You know, I think there's been a lot of research about on-ramping and how you can accelerate that. And I think that's a great way to, to think about how you not only expand diversity, but also really tap into an incredible talent pool that, that kind of got sidelined a bit over the past couple of years. I think it's time to have a more intimate conversation about it. Um, I, I often hear you know, leaders saying, yes, we support this, we understand these problems, we've read this book, or we've been to this seminar, we've done this unconscious bias training. Um, but often they're not really um, having the conversation with the communities they're specifically trying to serve. I, I think getting in the trenches actually helps not just form relationship, it allows people to be vulnerable, it, it, it engenders a level of trust that allows us to truly serve those communities, be they uh, women, people of color, um, uh, or, or any faith, or, or whatever the, the uh, scenario of the underrepresented group is. I think truly having the closer conversation that's not uh, kind of read the book, you know, follow the steps it, it is really important. I know Vista has done that uh, in, in some of the different um, portfolio companies, and I've heard some great results in that. And I think it's just if you can um, be vulnerable to that intimate conversation where you're really having the conversation with the groups that you're trying to represent, I think it's important. Yeah, I'd say it's intimate and it's a little bit uncomfortable, yeah. uh, quite honestly, because you're probably going to get some feedback and some ideas and input that. It might make you have to rethink how you're doing a variety of things. And so I think not only do you have to be willing to engage in those intimate personal conversations, but then also be willing to make some changes, you know, that might be uncomfortable for others. Um, but it, it's kind of what's going to be needed in, in some ways to push that through. Uh, you know, I guess, you know, as you, uh, to maybe double click into this a little bit and make it a bit personal if I can, you know, there's this whole notion that comes up around this, you know, kind of uh, imposter syndrome and, you know, and, and how do you think about your role and, and your confidence and ability to do the job and are you in the role because you're qualified or you're in the role because you're, you know, you're a gender candidate or a diverse candidate. So have you dealt with that at all on a personal level? I'd love to hear any thoughts you might have about, about that. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to um, start. Uh, so one thing over the last few years, especially while working remotely the last two years, uh, is exactly what you're saying, Ronnie, making myself more vulnerable as a leader, making myself more accessible and available. Uh, I've personally hosted global town halls, live town halls for two years. Every Thursday morning with my hat on, live Slack channel, any employee can ask me anything, live, right? That is a hot seat. <laughs> and when it comes to imposter syndrome, it was interesting. The other thing, I've really made an effort, especially while 
uh, where remote because I just can't imagine being a new employee or being a new manager, joining a company, joining a community, and you're remote and you're in your little studio apartment and you haven't met your colleagues face to face. So I had the opportunity last week, I make sure I meet all new employees that join IES. We do, a, usually it's like every other week, an onboarding call. And uh, one new employee last week asked me about imposter syndrome. And what was interesting about the question was, um, I don't wanna say there was an assumption that when you become a CEO or a C-level executive, you just wave a wand and it goes away. <laughs> like, absolutely not. And um, because of my position in technology over the last 20 years, I've become very, I have thick skin, and I've been able to tune out the skeptics, um, and I've confronted a lot of skepticism, questions about my capabilities, questions, you know, stay, stay as a CRO, you know, you don't have what it takes to be a CEO, and I still face those headwinds today, um, but what I do is I lean into, I've got a small posse of supporters and a group that really cheers me on, and I just tune out um, that skepticism, those what I call headwinds, and just lean in uh, to my team and those who have been big supporters of me. No, oh, that's great. Right. One part about my background I didn't share, um, if I was answering your question like <laughs> <laughs> directly earlier. Um, I, uh, I began my career, um, it's had a lot of interesting kind of twists and turns, totally non-linear. Um, but there was a, a point that I'd uh, worked for a, a different private equity uh, firm and I was at a senior director level and that leadership team went on to a different company um, and uh, moved back to a different city. And I decided that I was gonna do work in public service. And I took a job for a third of my salary um, and I got the title of supervisor. Uh, and I, I did some work for, uh, it was the city of Austin, um, for a year, and it was, I thought it was pretty incredible and significant. However, I had this supervisor title. Um, and a local state agency called me up after hearing about the work that we'd done um, and offered me, like literally I went into the meeting, and they said, we'd like you to be our new CIO. Talk about imposter syndrome. Like, it hit hard. And I, uh, I called a friend of mine, and he said, you know what, Ronnie? If someone asked me right now, do I want to be the president of the United States, I would tell them, send me Air Force One. And I literally keep that in my purse. Anytime I feel that imposter syndrome, send me Air Force One. So lean in, y'all. Did you experience that at all? Or do you, do you struggle with that at, at all, Rachel? Yeah, you know, I think everyone does. And I don't think it's just a, a female issue. I think it's anytime you're getting outside of your comfort zone or doing something new, you should be uncomfortable. And if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. And so, I, you know, on a every time I try something new, I go through that cycle of, do I do I have what it takes? You know, what's the expertise I need? What do I have the right skill set? And you know, I think what's incredible, even just even just hearing kind of both of your stories, is you know, it's all about figuring out how the self awareness to know that it's happening, but then also having the support system and the skills to go figure out how to how to build those new skill sets. And I think throughout my career, every time I've done something new, I've gone through that process of saying, you know, what works and what doesn't. And, and I think you have to be really self-aware and tuned in to figure that out. But I, I hope everyone actually feels uncomfortable. Yeah, no, I, I, I did a, another panel recently and this, this topic came up. It's a very hot topic, it seems like. I, I think I've addressed it three times in the last four panels I've done. Um, but you know, and one of the points I made was if you don't feel a little bit of nervousness and anxiety going into any new role or any role that you're in, you know, I think that's healthy. It, it's healthy to, to push you to, to, to be your best self, but then the ability to quickly flip some of that, those feelings of inadequacy or this, this, this self-doubt into motivation. Uh, and so for me, and again, I, I don't know obviously the experience of a woman in the workplace, but I can tell you as an African-American, especially when I got some pretty big jobs, like I got, you know, when I was gonna become the chief of staff, and head of strategy to the CEO of Microsoft. You know, that was a pretty big job for a kid, you know, from a small town in Virginia. Um, I felt like I had six months to kind of, you know, prove that I'm supposed to be there. And if I couldn't 
put some point on the board somewhere in six months. Maybe, maybe it's right, you know. And but that then motivated me to get some quick wins early. That then, you know, it, it then it kind of self fulfills. But I do think it is something that we all deal with in terms of am I at, it, am I supposed to be in this job? And then your ability to perform uh, uh, definitely then then makes it. And flipping that's motivation, you know. Uh, all right, let me shift gears a little bit since we're talking about technology and there's been a lot of strides. Uh, in different areas, uh, and I'm gonna, you know, there's a, there's a hard shift to the right, uh, not not a good transition, I apologize. Um, but talking a little bit about uh, kind of the advances in technology and the things that are uh, that are happening right now, and, and as a, you know, and maybe Ronnie, I'll, I'll start with you a little bit, you know, look at, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and a lot of these different areas that are happening where, uh, if you have a very non-diverse group working on some of these platforms, they might have some, you know, uh, consequences and ripple effect on, on other communities just because you, the inputs are different and so you know I know something you probably think about a fair amount and I'm sure you do as Lisa as well maybe Ronnie will start with you I do because I've been traveling again and <laughs> every time I go through an X one of those x-ray machines the new ones the ones you have to do this with um, probably about 60 to 70 percent of the time I'm pulled to the side and I get pat down in the same region because that machine the AI on that machine doesn't understand the density of my body or my specific figure um, my husband's Caucasian, and we've been together for 10 years. I, there's no point in taking a selfie. Like, they're just, the, the picture quality on most of the phones don't understand the lighting differences uh, to highlight our skin. And so um, it sucks that, you know, this many years in, I don't have great pictures of us. I get excited, though, when I see, like, Google and Google Pixel um, specifically working on problems like that. And so there is, there's a really, really um, important opportunity for companies to have diverse talent to really see and see the kind of the whole perspective of an opportunity and the whole perspective of a challenge that I hope we start to take better advantage of. You know, and then, Lisa, as you think about supporting your customers and helping your customers support their customers, obviously, you know, do you think about, you know, your diverse audience of customers? Does that impact how you all think about your product design and your product direction or who's doing it and who's giving inputs to your team? How do you manage that? Uh, sure. So IAS, we're a digital media quality company. And, uh, for example, what our solutions do right now, we recently built a classification technology for TikTok. So we classify video, image, audio, text, real time. Our solutions classify things like hate speech, right? Or violent content, violent videos, inappropriate content uh, on behalf of marketers because marketers do not want to be adjacent to things like hate speech. Um, and uh, our marketer community, we have over 2,000 advertisers globally. We're very much a global uh, company and our publisher uh, customers. Diversity is top of mind for them. The efficiency of our technology and our ability to play the role of Switzerland in classifying digital content is just top of mind. And so balancing both in terms of ensuring we're bringing in a diverse workforce, we're bringing in best-in-class engineers, data scientists, mathematicians who can build best-in-class technology to tackle these really relevant, important issues like hate speech is just paramount. Yeah. No, it's good, and, and I think that's going to be an area where we're going to, as an industry, uh, have to continue to make sure that we're applying resources. And, and this is a, a definitely an area where the best attempt sometimes can have very unintended consequences on the other side if you don't have the right inputs from a, a you know, diverse set of folks, you know, programming, designing, running the algorithms, building the algorithms that then allow for some of the output you know, th that we've mentioned. Okay, you know, I think we're gonna, uh, we've got a few questions from the audience that came in already. I think I'll um, start with those and then we've got a mic runner, I think, somewhere. Um, so if there's uh, any questions here, we've got about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll take a few and then I've got a couple more in case we don't have a, a lot of audience participation here. But here we go, let's start with, uh, with one that came in uh, specifically around um, how has, you know, the virtual workplace uh, changed some of the conversations as they relate to uh, onboarding, mentoring, connecting with women in the workplace, and some of the resources that you can provide in an office. Now you've got to, you've had to provide some of those resources virtually for two years. So maybe just talk about this new world. And I think we're still unsure what we're going to look like going forward. Is it back to pre 2019? Is it some hybrid of that? Is it something completely different? Um, but be that as it may, the last two years definitely forced us to do some things differently. And so I'd love to hear 
from, from each of you, a little bit about things that you had to do differently, specifically around supporting women in the workplace and, and women in business and, and as they're, they're matriculating their careers. Rachel, we'll start with you. You know, I think one of the most important things that's come out of the past couple years is just a reminder of how important personal relationships are. Um, as it relates to living on Zoom all day long, kind of straight through from you know 8 a.m. to some days, you know, 6, 8, 10 p.m., we've lost in some cases that connection. And as it relates to how we've changed that or how at least on our team we've spent time thinking about it, it's really about spending time one-on-one -on -one and reconnecting with folks because as we're dealing with you know resignations and attrition across all of technology and across you know all around the world, it really is a reminder that people work for people. And it's understanding, it's being known as a person, it's sharing yourself authentically, it's asking for help, it's offering help. And I think that's probably been the biggest thing. It's simple and, and not, not technology-based, but actually I would say probably the most effective at really thinking about how our teams work. So I work for TIPCO. We're a data analytics and integration company, and so we're looking at a lot of data right now. Um, we have made our offices available to our staff, so we've taken a very different tact. We're not calling it return to office or come back in. Um, for our team members who don't have great home working conditions, they can come and use our offices. One of the things that we've been doing is looking at the data. The utilization's different in, in the different regions. Um, but what we have certainly seen through some of our survey, our sentiment surveys, is that women aren't coming back as, uh, as quickly as men are, um, and that concerns us. And so we know because we have this data, we have to do something to democratize the opportunity. Uh, we know that if you're having the water cooler chat with the CEO or some CVL of exec, you're probably not potentially being, you know, invited into the same level of access of opportunity. And so we are looking at the data and figuring out what is it we need to do to make sure that we've got uh, an environment that has, you know, doesn't create an unintended uh, lack of equity. Um, given we've all been working remotely over the last two years, and you know my thoughts on Zoom, gotta love Zoom, but the one um, silver lining of Zoom and working remotely is in many ways, I'm a big believer, it's an equalizer. Everyone has a front row seat at the table. It doesn't matter function, title, geography, location, gender, like we are in meetings where that live town hall, what I was speaking to before, or new hire meetings or ERG meetings that it's something I really encourage employees um, to speak up. And the, you know, I've had employees say to me, but Lisa, I'm an introvert. It's very difficult for me to speak up in Zoom. I'm like, Slack your question. Can you type a question in Slack? Yes, I can. Can you send a one pager of how, you know, your thoughts on how uh, we could change our technology, improve our products, improve the customer experience? So that's one thing that I've really tried to encourage at IES with Zoom is take full advantage. And in many ways, it's been a unifier for our company, especially because we're so global. I see employees making connections and personal connections, and it doesn't matter where they're based or what their title or function is. And that's something I think as we are now pivoting into a hybrid world, um, that we m maintain that connection. No, and I, I, we've seen the benefit of that in, in many different areas. No, I totally agree. Any questions from the audience? Keep thinking. We got time. Uh, okay, here's here's a good one. Um, so each of you, you know, you you you, you champion diversity initiatives in your respective organizations in different ways, either directly uh, or or indirectly through that support, and maybe not not here or here or in other parts of your career. What have you done or how have you played through some of the challenges where you might have, you know, your boss or the leadership that, are, that might be non-diverse and they're kind of questioning, hey, why do we need to make this investment? Why do we need to spend this time? Or they might just kind of have, let's call it passive support. Like, okay, yeah, Ronnie, if you need to do that, you know, I, I told the example the other day, you know, when I was talking to a, an ERG group um, that, you know, way back when, when I was at, at, at another company, 
the ERG group was like this little side project. Yeah, go do that and, and let me know and to just stay busy. Where now I see a lot of executives spending time with the ERG teams, wanting to go get feedback from them. Uh, but regardless, so, you know, as you think about your career, how have you played through or at least gotten some of those audiences uh, to understand the importance of some of the work that, that you've been initiating and trying to get done? Starting with Ronnie again. We'll go with Ronnie again because I know she's uncomfortable, so we're working on it. So I'm just going to keep starting with. <laughs> so, so what I've done historically is, is really kind of build justifications, making sure people understand the importance of um, supporting these you know, affinity groups, resource groups, whatever we would call them back in the day. Um, and, and their level of engagement and their, the support that, that companies give those team members uh, helps endear them to the company. It helps uh, kind of bring out some of the best, not just ideas, um, but just really kind of the higher levels of engagement. You know, I, I can't imagine that there's any leader today that thinks there's any, that there's any optionality around this. You know, when we think about the great resignation and what's happening with the talent markets globally, there, there's just there's no better time than now to, to think about more holistic approaches to both retaining your best talent, but also recruiting. And I know it's something that, um, you know, the data is so well published and speaks for itself. And I think to your point, the justifications are out there. Um, but I also think, you know, as, as people leaders, there really, there, there isn't an option other than to lean and think holistically. And, and at the end of the day, the employees are telling us this matters. Um, I can share a story. So uh, after Microsoft, I went to Amazon to build the ad business. And I was one of the most senior female leaders there. Amazon, I could probably count on one hand how many female leaders there were. Very few. And um, a couple years in, uh, a few of us decided to launch Women in Amazon. Uh, it was a female ERG. And I reached out to a few very senior male executives saying, can you sponsor this? Can you come speak? We're going to launch in all hands. And there was resistance. And I was trying to figure out how can I encourage, and I'm not going to say his name, but this one very senior male executive. And finally I realized, I, I changed the conversation. I said, how are you girls doing? What grades are they in now? Mm. Well, they're in uh, seventh, uh, seventh grade and a freshman. Do it for your daughters. Why don't you do it for them? And that was, the, the, the light went off. And then I had one, that senior executive, up at an all hands, talking about his support and sponsorship of women at Amazon, talking about his daughters, the future for girls in technology. And all it took was that one executive to stand up and say that, and guess what happened? Then I had a bunch of other male executives getting up saying, you're right, I have girls too. So that, now that the tactic's out and everyone knows, <laughs> but it has been a very effective way to encourage senior level male leaders to lean in um, and to help support diversity. No, I, I love that actually. And, and I don't know, Rachel, uh, Ronnie, is, do you have maybe a, an example or a story where you kind of hit a wall and you had to go around? It was clearly because it was your woman or it was a, it was a woman oriented initiative that you had to find an, another way to get it going? Kind of finding an ally, absolutely. Um, one of the other things that I've used, and it's kind of a business justification in a sense, um, is our customers are asking for it. My team um, responds to and aggregates the responses to our customer RFPs. Our customers are asking for what are we doing in ESG, they're asking what are we doing for uh, in our diversity initiatives, and they're demanding, and people want to invest, obviously people want to, to join companies. Um, I, uh, I, I joined TIBCO uh, in the middle of the pandemic, um, a little bit activated by uh, the murder of George Floyd, wanting to be part of a vista, frankly, for, for the work that Robert Smith was doing um, in, in speaking out. And I joined the company, the portfolio company, because I wanted to be a part of something I believed in. And I think uh, people join for things that they're passionate about. And uh, it, after a while, like the, the numbers speak, the customers ask for it, and our employees speak with their feet when they don't see that represented. No, I think that's great. I think that's super important. I think. Everyone has said that as it becomes more and more a quote unquote business imperative that's, you know, that's being affected by customers and by employees, that's when we've really gotten to a point where you know, we know we can get the right mind share. Um, oh, we do have one question from the audience. Thank you. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, my name is Anna Mkhitaryan and I'm part of the Executive MBA program. 
I'm curious, um, all of you have touched upon kind of resistance in the workplace and uh, being a female leader, and I'm curious as to what you feel is the biggest barrier to female leadership, and how do you navigate the resistance that you might face in the, in the workplace? I think it's a, it's a great question, and, and it goes back to probably, you know, when we all started, the representation issue of not having, not being able to see what it would be like to be a senior leader. And, and I think, you know, Ronnie's example of, you know, not, not having folks to, to emulate, because at the end of the day, when you're early in your career, you have to emulate. It's the only way you learn new skills. And so I think it, it starts with representation. I think now that we're starting to get better representation, we're not there yet. You know, it's also really about understanding yourself and being authentic and, and being able to, pl to play to your strengths, to be honest. Um, every time someone tries, it, it's obvious that any time someone's trying to be someone else, and especially as you become more senior and as you build your career, I think being able to play to your strengths is one of the most important you know, pieces of advice I know I can share. I, I would, um, the way I'd respond to that is when I think about female leaders that I know, uh, there are so many women who doubt themselves and they think, but I'm not completely ready. I don't have all the skills in my toolbox. And men do not think that way. They just, <laughs> sorry, Martin, they don't, right? They have, there's 60% there and they're like, yep, I'm the next CEO. And I think, um, and it's, an example Ronnie gave, and I also, I remember when I was interviewing, I don't think I told you this, for the CEO job at IES, and I met a former colleague around the corner of the office for lunch right before my last round of interviews. I had a COO job, a job offer in hand. And I remember at the lunch, he looked, we were together at Yahoo, and he looked me in the eye and he said, I saw what you did at Yahoo. You are CEO. You are CEO material. Now go up and get an offer. I mean, he was literally that direct with me. And we need more colleagues like that and more peers and more support. And that, I'm, with the first example, I shared that intention, that we are very intentional and we pull women aside and we give them that support and words of encouragement that they need. Well, that's great. I think we, we, I, I'm getting the, the wrap up here. So we're gonna wrap up with maybe a, uh, 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 is it a quick one or, okay, I'm sorry. I just, they, she's giving me the hook, I'm gonna get in trouble. Uh, so, uh, so really quick, you know, as we close out, um, here's a, a closing question for each of you. So go back in time, some of you further than others. Uh, you're in Georgia, leaving Spelman or Georgia Institute, or you're NYU finishing up in maybe a couple years out of Linfield College, and you're looking back. You know, what would you tell your younger self, uh, you know, entering the workforce and beginning the career that you had as we sit here now in this beautiful new Manhattanville campus? And I'm going to say the inaugural big event because it's the first time you spoke here. So the inaugural event here, uh, what would you tell yourself coming into your career? Don't just choose your job, choose your leader. Make sure that that leader's values align with your own, they align with your own value system. Um, look for the results in their work. And you'll see, you know, if you're, if you're, um, you strongly believe and you want to see the results of DE&I, you'll see it in their hire and you'll see it. So don't just listen to what they say, see if they're walking the walk. And so absolutely choose your leader. You guys are at the stage um, where it's not the job, it's the leader because the leader's gonna be, gonna be the one that helps propel your career. You know, we talk a lot about at Vista this concept of honoring the opportunity that we all have, and and for me, what if what if I could go back and tell myself something? It would be that opportunity never looks like what you think it will be. It's the craziest projects, it's the moves, it's personally and professionally the out of the box experiences where I learned the most and grew the most. And at Vista, I've had incredible opportunities, but it hasn't been a straight path. And it's been because those opportunities have come in the form of messy projects and you know, earlier in our investing careers, you know, turnarounds. Um, but really, I think you know, being open to trying something new is really how, at least for me, I've been able to grow and build self-awareness um, and, and skill set. But I think you know, look, for, look for the unexpected opportunities and then jump right in. Yeah, just to build on that, I would say, this is my tune out the skeptics again, but uh, another mentor from Microsoft taught me, choose the job no one else wants and turn it into a success. That's not my current job. <laughs> okay. But I did it three times before joining IES, and 
there was a lot of head scratchers, a lot of uh, skeptics saying, when I went to Amazon, people said, you are out of your mind. Why are you going there? They're not invest, this was early days, not invested in media. One of the best decisions I ever made. And again, I tuned out the skeptics and I just uh, stayed true to myself that I want to lean in and transform a company or build a business, and it was absolutely the right next step in my career. No, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, and I can't, I'm a little bit biased because I have the benefit of working with these three phenomenal leaders and that also happen to be women uh, on a daily, monthly, weekly basis. Uh, but I, I really have appreciated learning from all of you, not just today, but in, in all my interactions with you. Uh, and so on behalf of my partner, Robert Smith and Vista Equity, again, I'd like to thank uh, the university and Dean Michael for, for allowing us to be here today and share with you for the, with this panel. Thank you very much. Ronnie, Rachel, Lisa, and Martin, thank you so much for sharing that conversation with us. Our next panel will begin at, in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.